One of the things I really like about the computer science department at UNC is the professors not only span a huge area of computer science, but they also mix it pretty well in the different areas. So you'll see professors working together on different projects. Right now in my group, for example, we're doing real-time systems, and one of the big applications is self-driving cars. So we're working with some people in the computer vision lab to figure out how we can improve self-driving car applications to make them safer. I work in an area called real-time systems, and what that means is I don't care only that a program runs correctly, I care that it runs on time. And that doesn't just mean that it's fast, it means it's predictable. So in a system like a self-driving car, I care that pedestrian detection runs on a specific frequency and it always finishes on time. Um, there's a bunch of other research areas in the department. There's security, graphics, robotics, um, medical image analysis, vision, and people also work on things between the areas. So there's a lot of different research happening. Uh, the department does a lot of different things. So there's graduate students and professors working together on research, as well as undergrads learning about computer science and doing research with uh, uh, grad, student, grad students and professors. So one thing I really like about the research the undergrads are able to do here is they don't have to know a bunch of stuff going into it. So we have an undergrad working in our group, and he didn't know as much as the grad students did ahead of time, so he helped with little pieces of the project to get familiar. Um, I've seen undergrads helping on anything ranging from tasks like doing a user study. So they'll meet with the different users and try out the product or watch the video and determine if it's accurate. Um, and as they progress through working in the group, they actually get more involved in the general project. So I've seen a huge range of it, but the professors and the grad students are pretty good about getting the undergrads up to speed without expecting them to already know everything that it takes four years to learn. So something that I think helps a student coming into the UNCCS department be really successful is being curious about the field. Um, it, you can get by by taking classes, maybe doing some internships, get a job, and you can be happy. But the people I've seen that really thrive are the ones who want to learn more. So they'll take a class and then they spend the summer doing a project on their own, something that was inspired by the class, but completely based off of their interests. And so I think that curiosity and that desire to apply what they're learning to their own lives is really great. So these are images taken from the South Building, which is one of the buildings here at UNC. Here somebody went around the building and took a bunch of photographs of it. And the idea is to go from these individual images and work out an actual 3D model of the scene. So in this case, we went from these images and turned it into this uh, 3D model here. Uh, so each one of these uh, red rectangles is one camera. But the idea is basically that uh, we uh, look at these images and we detect uh, points in the images that could be recognizable, say corners of windows. And once we have that information, then we try to match, uh, find corresponding points in multiple images. So if I have these two images, say, I might want to find points on the door that match up. And uh, then I determine that this is a correspondence between the two images. And I kind of work up from there uh, to actually figure out where these points might lie in 3D and actually place them there. And at the same time, recover the position at which the images were taken, these each one of these red rectangles here. And so in the end, you get this 3D model. And this is kind of like the first step in actually um, going from imagery to like nice, realistic uh, models. This is kind of like our final output is once we have these camera positions, we can actually uh, build up uh, denser and nicer uh, representations of the scene. So here we had um, a drone flying over a golf course. And we got a bunch of individual images and uh, we join them together using this first approach, which is called structure from motion. And then once we do that, then uh, we can build up actual, like, realistic models. So if someone was, say, uh, wanted to use this um, for mapping terrain of an environment or obtaining uh, a 3D model of a building that they could view, say, in virtual reality or augmented reality, um, or uh, other applications could include, like, autonomous driving, um, there's, there's so many applications for 
figuring out where cameras or where images are located um, and figuring out what the shape and uh, structure of terrain is, shape and structure of buildings are. I think the thing that's most rewarding is going from basically having no information, which is just the images, and actually building up things that look really realistic and that where you can actually kind of have this idea of visiting somewhere that you've never been before uh, just because you can build up a 3D model of it and, and look at it. Once we have these 3D models and we want to visualize them, one of the things that is missing is that we don't have any people in the scene. Um, and we also don't, our method right now doesn't really get ground surfaces, so one thing that we've uh, been working towards is actually placing people into the scene just by detecting them in the individual images and, uh, and going from there and making some reasoning about where they might be standing. And one of the other things that uh, we've worked on at UNC is building up th 3D models of the inside of the body. If, someone, if a doctor suspects that uh, a patient has throat cancer and they want to uh, see if they have a tumor, what they'll do is they'll do an endoscopy, which is where they thread a camera through the nose and down into the throat and they get a video of the throat, and there they can see maybe if there's a tumor present. But one of the problems is that when the doctors uh, actually want to maybe perform some procedure like removing the tumor, and they're not able to use this data in any meaningful way. They can just look at, say, a CT scan and say roughly where they think the tumor is based on what they saw in the endoscopy. So one of the projects that we, were work that we have been working on is to take the endoscopy and actually turn it into a 3D model that we can view in the space of the CT. And there the doctor can actually see the texture and the color of the tumor and better localize it for treatment. Um, we've also done work on this in the colon as well. So one of the things that we've become interested in is how are people going to interact in VR? So it's not enough to just have somebody be physically present. They should look like them. They should move like them. They should work the way that they work. So we've been using some brand new fancy equipment to actually physically scan people's avatars, take their whole body and bring it into virtual reality, and then try to capture the motions that they produce when they move. So essentially, we've developed a pipeline where we can bring someone into our lab. We can take a scan of their body. We use a Kinect Center to capture properties of their movements. We can analyze those movements, and from a, a database of high quality human motion, we can actually generate their walking style and generate a virtual avatar that they can use to play games or interact socially that looks and moves the way that they do. So how long does it take to do something like this? Well, right now we can bring someone into our lab. We take a physical scan of their body, which takes about a minute. That physical scan gets uploaded to the cloud and processed, and then we actually do the whole walking study while that video is processing. And by the time that's done, usually about 15 minutes later, we can have their avatar ready to put into a game. So the end result is that we're now looking at how to design social experiences that revolve around playing games and interacting with other people using your own avatar. So what you're seeing here is my, my co-author on these papers um, and the lead researcher on a lot of these products, uh, Project Sahil, and I are actually going to play a game where we're moving around in VR we're interacting with virtual agents, we're talking to the crowd, all using our own bodies and our own walking styles. So the other aspect of my research here is leveraging some of what we've learned about how people and, and entities navigate to do some work in self-driving cars. So we've actually built a simulator in partnership with uh, some colleagues at the University of Central Florida where we can test cars driving around on the road and subject them to emergency conditions and see how they react. So this vehicle is actually planning and, and navigating autonomously and we can do things like having a car pull out in front of it. And it swerves to avoid it safely. And the idea is that when we use simulation to test these kind of things, we can put the vehicles in dangerous situations where we might not be willing to put a real driver, but we can still test and evaluate how safe autonomous vehicles are. Ultimately, these kind of vehicles will have a huge impact on the future of transport and life in the United States and around the world once we can solve the problems of safety and, and those kind of issues. So these are just some of the projects that researchers like me get to work on here at the University of North Carolina and researchers all over the country. So pursuing a career in computer science and an advanced degree in this field gives you the opportunity to work on cutting edge problems that have direct impacts on the lives of billions of people. For example, with autonomous driving, we're at the, the cusp of a revolution which will change the way every person on this planet lives. And these are the kind of problems we get to tackle and the kind of impacts we get to make 
when, when we work in computer science. And you can work in entertainment. You don't have to just work in engineering or autonomous driving. There are millions of possibilities uh, when you get a degree in a field like this. There's a certain kind of thinking that's required for computer science. Um, you have to be able to break problems down logically. Think of things in steps. Because a lot of times what's intuitive for humans is not so intuitive when we try to encode it in machines. So well, one thing I would suggest is try logic puzzles. Try to think about things as a sequence of steps. Can you think about how a design gets created from start to finish and try to work that out? Um, obviously, there is a lot of programming, so familiarity with computers is a good idea. It's never too early to start. And in fact, there are more tools available now than ever to self-study some basic computer science concepts, to learn to do some basic programming on your own. There, there's a multitude of resources, even before you get into college, that can give you a jump start on, on how to solve these kind of problems and tackle these issues. So I work in um, surgical robotics here at UNC in the Department of Computer Science. And mainly what we're looking at is enabling minimally invasive surgery um, through new robotic technologies. And so a lot of these technologies um, look a lot different than what you would expect robots to look like. Um, they can look like small um, needle tentacle-like devices. And so that's kind of the, the class of robots that we work on here from a surgical robotics perspective. Currently in minimally invasive surgery, a lot of the tools end up looking a lot like this tool here, which um, as you can see is what would be inserted into the body, but is very long and straight. And this means that in order to get to different parts of anatomy, the physicians have to frequently um, make very large holes in the patient to get the tools to the piece of anatomy that they want to manipulate surgically. So what we're looking at doing is instead of having long straight devices like this, um, adding small curved devices to the physician's toolbox. So that would be things that look like this, maybe, or this. And if we have these small curved devices, what we can then do is access different pieces of anatomy in less invasive fashion. So if we have, say, a tumor in the pituitary gland, which is in the base of the skull in your brain, then it, rather than having to open up large holes in the anatomy to get to that, uh, we can enable the physician to go in through the nasal passageway and um, do that surgery in a much more minimally invasive fashion. So that's what this robot here is designed to do. So it's made up of nested pre-curved nitinol tubes, uh, which is what these are. And nitinol is a super elastic material. It's a nickel titanium alloy. And what these tubes, the property that these tubes have that makes them special is that when we set their shape, so we put a curve into this tube, um, from then on it will be flexible but return to that shape we set it in. So what this allows us to do is take multiple of these tubes and nest them inside one another. And then we can rotate and translate these tubes with respect to one another. And that causes the tubes themselves to take very interesting curved shapes through space. And so then by rotating and translating these tubes, we can manipulate um, tissue through these nasal passageways um, without having to make large holes in, in your uh, anatomy. This doesn't look like what you think a robot looks like, what you see on TV with big arms and um, moving around maybe. So basically it's a robot because it's manipulated by these motors and um, it causes some change in the world. So that's what we think of as robots, something that's moving and causing change in the world. So these are the motors here that um, drive this robot and there are six of them total because there are three tubes. So it takes two motor motors um, to manipulate each tube. What we do here at UNC in the Department of Computer Science is we take sensory input for the robot in the form of CT scans of the patient's anatomy and magnetic tracking systems that tell us what the state of the robot is with respect to the patient's anatomy. And we take that input and some specification of what the physician wants the robot to do in the anatomy. And we determine via motion planning algorithms what the motors each need to do in order to make the robot accomplish that task that the physician is specifying. In order to um, evaluate our algorithms and experiment with this robot, currently we're doing work in 3D printed anatomical models. So that's like um, this 3D printed model of the skull base here. And we get these by taking CT scans of patients and um, segmenting out um, these volumes from the CT scan and then creating a mesh of the surface and then sending that to be 3D printed. Um, so by doing that, it allows us to experiment in anatomy that's exactly the same as what would be in the patient, but without having to um, experiment with tissue at this stage yet. To get into this work, you don't need a medical background. One of the wonderful things about UNC is that we work very closely with um, the physicians and surgeons in the medical school here. So they kind of handle the medical background for this. And we come in 
um, with a computational background. So if you have experience with programming, if you have experience with math, with physics, um, these are all really great stepping stones to get you um, into work like what I do here with this robot. What I really like about robotics specifically is um, when you look at the field of computer science, a lot of the other fields, you write code, you can um, solve a lot of very complicated problems, but at the end of the day, a lot of it's kind of contained in the computer. What's neat about robotics is that the code that you write, the algorithms that you develop, actually ends up moving things in the real world because these robots go around changing how the physical state of the world um, is. And that's not something that you get in a lot of areas of computer science, and that's something that I find particularly satisfying. So a lot of what I was describing with the surgical robots where we determine how to move the robots in the real world to accomplish some task doesn't have to stay restricted to the surgical robots. So a lot of those algorithms that we develop actually apply to these robots as well, which look a lot more like what you expect robots to look like when you think of robots. So we have three robots here in the lab. We have this robot, which is the fetch robot. We have this little guy, which is the now robot. And this large robot over here is Baxter. And so we use all three of these to do experimentation with these motion planning algorithms to see how well our algorithms are performing in the real world. Most of our robots are stationary. We call them manipulators because they take arms or something like the tentacles that you saw in the surgical robot and manipulate the world. Uh, the robots like the Mars rover or the MIT um, running animal-based robots, those are more mobile robots. And so these are kind of two different fields in robotics, but a lot of the algorithms apply to both. But um, this robot here, Fetch, actually is a mobile robot with a manipulator arm. So we call that a mobile manipulator. But um, Fetch drives around in the world and then can manipulate the state of the world with its arm as well. So in a lot of sense, or in some senses, the algorithms required to tell Fetch where to go in the world before it starts manipulating things, those are very similar to what you would see um, when you're trying to determine how to move the Mars rover around the surface of Mars. For these robots, the sensors are very different. This, this robot has an RGBD depth sensor, like what you uh, would imagine like the Microsoft Connect has. And um, this robot has some ultrasonic sensors as well as this one, and we use um, a lot of cameras and other things to, to kind of get the state of the environment as well as the state of the robot. That's a lot different than with the surgical robots where we're looking at magnetic fields and CT scans. But at the end of the day, it's just some input telling you the state of the world and you're trying to generate the output for the motors to tell the robot what to do. One of the big challenges with mobile robots and mobile manip manipulators like Fetch is battery life. So a lot of what we look at, especially in the algorithmic side, is how to make the robot do the things that it needs to do while it consumes as little power as possible. And that means making the motor movements very efficient, making the planning for the paths that the robots take very efficient, and even making the code which has to execute on the robot very efficient because the CPUs take up power as well, not just the motors. So a lot of what we do is determining these motions for the motors and writing code that's optimal from a power consumption standpoint because battery life is a very big constraint and a very um, applicable topic in, in robotics. At the end of the day, what you want to do is take some sensor input and um, determine how to move the motors in the robot to accomplish the task. That's the same for both the surgical robots and these robots, but the sensors look a lot different. The motors look a lot different, and how the motors actuate the robot in the world looks a lot different between these different cases.